Then I shall begin. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Torres and I'm working in the Computer Vision Center uh, uh, in Barcelona in the document analysis group. And today I wanted to present uh, the work that resulted from, uh, well, that produced a Nismir publication last year and uh, was developed under the context of my bachelor's thesis. So the goal is the following. Um, as you might, uh, as we have already been discussing during this, uh, this workshop, reading music is, uh, is very difficult, but even more so when we delve into the matter of old handwritten music. Uh, mainly because, aside from the uh, intrinsic complexities of music, we now have to deal with uh, paper degradation issues. We now have irregular symbols. We now have non-parallel stuffs, ink stains, and some other forms of irregular notation uh, due to um, authors' uh, personal interests in terms of notation and so on and so forth. For the sake of comparison, this very same piece can be transcribed here in a modern standards by the Open Source Project, which is um, you know, to illustrate the, the shift in difficulty. So overall, even if we had a very decent optical music recognition system, we are prone to making mistakes because um, some of these scores are intrinsically ambiguous. So by making the assumption that some of these, uh, some of these mistakes can be corrected uh, because they are rare combinations of musical symbols, we can employ statistical tools. Henceforth, we're going to uh, delve into language models. Since we are using uh, 1D uh, sequential output, we're basically going to use the same as we would for regular English uh, written language. Now, the kind of mistake that we would aim to correct is the following. Uh, it wouldn't make much sense to have two claps uh, right next to each other. However, given the shape of the, of the symbol, it's possible that our model has instead uh, confused it with a C time signature. Now, of course, we're assuming that this uh, actual correct symbol uh, appears uh, within the most likely um, outputs from each classification step. But we'll see how we combine those. First, let's delve into the architecture. We're working with a sequence to sequence model, which uh, uh, basically works the following way. This is more or less the same model that we presented last year in Worms, but I'm going to repeat it for the sake of completeness. The idea is that we have a backbone to which uh, CNN to which we fit the input measure which uh, produces a set of features, uh, width times height times channels. Uh, we remove the last max pooling layer to have more available features. And then we feed this to through a recurrent bidirectional encoder, which produces an annotated version of that same uh, input volume. With an attention mechanism, um, what we can do then is for each time step of the output sequence, we can say, okay, which are the most relevant uh, uh, elements in this uh, sequence? for the output decoding step. And we basically average all the elements through this weighted function that is the attention. And we produce um, a single uh, vector that is um, basically fully context aware uh, to perform inference. This is fed into the decoder and this produces an output. Now the proposal for this, uh, for this work was, okay, Let's add an agnostic language model, which is not influenced by uh, uh, visual features whatsoever, but keeps track of uh, contextual elements of the score. So the idea is the language model is initially trained independently. And what we do is the, we join this, uh, the output of both the full pipeline classifier and the language model through a fusion mechanism. And then the output that we consider correct is the aggregation of both how to join these two architectures. Now, the literature has proposed uh, plenty of models. Uh, there has been some others which we tried uh, to implement but couldn't really uh, work through. But essentially, there are three uh, that we chose for this work. The first one is shallow fusion, which is the simplest and most straightforward. We just grab the um, log it output of uh, both the language model and the sequence to sequence architecture. We compute the logarithm and we at both values. We have to take into account, though, that we scale the language model value by a lambda, uh, by a lambda constant so that we can leverage the, uh, the amount of information of context that we want to fit into our final output. For deep fusion, uh, what we do is we instead uh, let the network learn this uh, lambda value by computing a gating uh, mechanism 
this, uh, the output of the language model passes through a fully connected layer and uh, an activation sigmoid. And then we um, multiply, uh, so the output is a single value, and then we multiply this sigma uh, value from here into the uh, output from the language model. Then we concatenate all the outputs and we pass through them a uh, fully connected layer. We do softmax and we do classification. Finally, candidate fusion works a little bit differently in the sense that the language model anticipates itself to the sequence to sequence model. So in a way, what the language model is doing is, okay, this is the distribution of tokens that I expect is going to be most likely in this time step. And then the sequence to sequence model can learn to leverage this information to produce the correct output. Now, the data that we have used for the, uh, the experiments is the following. These are the Ibaro data sets. They are synthetic uh, for training. And then we have used one uh, real handwritten uh, set of scores. Note, however, that this uh, data set is very small. We have barely 250 samples or between 250 and 300 samples. So we cannot really um, train a model end-to-end -end only using this information. So what we do is we use all three data sets. How? What we do is we combine them in a curriculum learning fashion. Note, however, I didn't mention that we devise a learning or a reading order in order to be able to perform inference, and we annotate primitives at a primitive level. So we do not have a single token that represents an entire musical complex. So um, by a training uh, using curriculum learning, what we mean is that we used a percentage of uh, uh, proceedingly more difficult scores into each time step. So at the beginning, we're only going to train with synthetic model samples. Uh, that's how we pre-train the classifier and the language model independently. And then when we join both models and train uh, jointly, we use synthetic old looking samples in a fixed percentage combined with all handwritten samples. What we do is we first start with 10% of synthetic old, sorry, 10% um, of real uh, handwritten samples and 90% of synthetic old looking samples. And we do a certain number of epochs uh, with uh, this setup and we keep increasing the number of real handwritten scores and reducing the number of synthetic old looking samples. Now to um, e equal the number of samples from one another, what we do is for each, uh, um, big batch of data, we duplicate uh, the hundred and samples to the number needed to fit the same number of, of synthetic ones, or the required, rather. So we basically perform a form of bootstrapping. We also have uh, data augmentation in place to avoid uh, series overfitting. Now, we also did an extra experiment uh, in which we trained the language model with a limited subset of data that closely aligned to the output um, uh, hundred and samples better. And the final results that we obtained in symbol error rate are the following. So what we found was that uh, given this is the sequence to sequence violin baseline and the CNN plus VLSTM baseline, this is from the literature. So I couldn't uh, employ the same uh, curriculum learning strategy. And what we found was that uh, by incorporating this language model, we could basically shave off up to six points more or less of symbol error rate from the uh, literature. Uh, we saw that uh, shallow, the shallow fusion scheme was the worst performing, but the conclusion um, was that we couldn't really find out what were the most significant examples where we were actually performing better. For instance, in some qualitative examples uh, that we drew using the architecture without the language model, we found that it was very frequent to have opening uh, tokens going unclosed. So it was good to see that the language model is very good at keeping up with these kind of things. Most of the mistakes that we're making are also based on the pitch of the nodes because admittedly they are quite ambiguous. But in this uh, field, we cannot really make uh, very educated predictions with the language model because we're restrained by um, the statistical nature of, of the model itself. In other words, um, since the choice of pitch is uh, based on the, uh, at the discretion of the composer, we can really assess more than, okay, this is the more likely pitch or not. This is some more examples showing the, that the pitches are the problems. And this one is very interesting because um, the language model has learned well that uh, there are recurrences such as uh, the pitch of the uh, elements that should be kept into account. 
which we think is one of the reasons, uh, again, it's keeping up with context that the model, the language model is helping perform better. So overall, there are many mistakes which are very hard to correct because they are based on style. And we also have uh, problems of, uh, between long dependencies in the sequence. The language model is helping improve these results. However, the uh, extent to which can be attributed to the language model or just to the increase in parameters is a little bit uncertain. Some of the corrections can be enforced using grammar instead, but we have to regularize the output language. And the thing is that whatever we do, we need more data because with 200 samples, there is only so far that we can go. Finally, I would like to comment on the fact that the evaluation metrics that we have employed don't really convey the strengths and weaknesses of the model and uh, make an open call to enforce, uh, to um, increase the use of uh, more musically aware uh, metrics to try to compare better the strengths of our models. So this has been everything on my side. I hope, uh, uh, and I hope to answer all your questions from now on. Thank you, thank you, Paul. You you opened the Pandora's box at the end with the metric. <laughs> well, at well, some that, point, well. at some point, we're going to have to face the <laughs> to face the, the, the big problems. But, uh, but for me, it's, I think it's a relevant point nonetheless because what I found is by trying to analyze the the results, I found it extremely hard to draw conclusions without them. So. Even if I'm not really comparing too much with the state of the art because we're using our own closed source model, uh, sorry, data, I think it's still relevant that we can uh, kind of inform our decisions better and find good and um, and um, consensuated, would it be, uh, uh, metrics to, to devices. So yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's what evaluation should be for, but... Mm. Unfortunately, we, we had to give numbers and try to, that our numbers are greater, whether it, if there are accuracy or, or lesser than, <laughs> uh, if there are error than the others. Well, anyway, uh, any questions for Pau? I have a lot, but I prefer the audience to. <laughs> I, I would like to thank you for the presentation. I think it, that uh, integrating a language model is gonna be really useful especially when the accuracy of our models is going to be relatively high so that we'll be able to catch uh, like uh, the harmony related mistakes when I know it's misclassified by one position so I think th this work is really useful anyway I wanted to ask you that about your training procedure you said that you start training on simple black and white images and then you add color and then you add the real images could you explain what was the motivation for doing it this way instead of training it like on everything simultaneously? So the, the concept of curriculum learning is that you assume that your first uh, samples are going to be much easier than those uh, later on. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter that they have color because we have a binarization step in the middle. So we binarize the image and what the network actually sees is only the 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 the, um, the grayscale uh, version of the image. But um, the idea is that it's basically that um, recognizing typeset scores we assume is an easier job. Actually, um, the results we have proved that because when we pre-train this model on, on the synthetic data set, we, ha we have sub 1% uh, similar rate results. And then we move on into more complicated endeavors. It's basically how, how it's arranged. Oh, and it's also a way of, yeah. sorry. Uh, whether whether it wasn't a uh, conver conversion, like uh, if there wasn't a problem with conversion or something, or maybe what do like you mean the, with conversion. Uh, I mean like uh, uh, conversion, convergence. Sorry. Hmm. So, so. No, not at all. Because that, that that's the kind of the point that we're trying to um, to fix with this curriculum learning strategy, which is that we're bridging the domain gap in a more um, smooth way, so to speak, because mm -hmm. we have a lot of typeset scores. So we train the bulk of the model with that. And then uh, the intrinsic language model that the sequence to sequence model has already knows how to uh, perform um, the transcription in the format that we want. When mm -hmm. we move into the more complicated scores, the fact that the model already knows how to produce this uh, allows the loss to, um, to have better um, and more educated values. This is something that I can draw a parallel to, to some of the closer models that I've been doing recently with more complicated out, uh, output formats, is that 
if you have a very uh, difficult output and you cannot find conversions early, the model is going to fail to converge, which is the, the issue that you were drawing. Right, to. right. That's what I was alluding to because I had these difficulties when I was training my model uh, earlier. And I got I got it resolved by adding a dropout on the recurrent layers. Hmm. So I was asking whether this was the reason you, you did this, because I almost also did this progressive training until I tried to drop out and it fixed it. So. <laughs> then yes, it's part part of the reason is that. And we also were using dropout. And with my recent research, I've seen that dropout and label smoothing seem to be uh, strong tools to deal to deal with these kind of issues to have variability on the output sequences. And yes, this is yeah, one of the main reasons. Thank you.